I am he who howls in the night. I am he who moans in the snow. I am he who hath never seen the light. I am he who mounts from below. My car is the car of death. My wings are the wings of dread. My breath is the north wind's breath. My prey are the cold and the dead. In old Alvreen, when schools were poor and few, and peasants fancied what they scarcely knew, when lords and gentry shunned their monarch's throne for solitary castles of their own, there dwelt a man of rank whose fortress stood in the hushed twilight of a hoary wood. Dublah his name, his lineage high and vast, a proud memorial of an honored past. But curious swains would whisper now and then that Sieur Dublah was not as other men. In person dark and lean, with glossy hair, and gleaming teeth that he would often bear, with piercing eye and stealthy roving glance, and tongue that clipped the soft sweet speech of France. The Sieur was little loved and seldom seen, so close he kept within his own domain. The castle servants, few, discreet, and old, full many a tale of strangeness might have told. But bowed with years, they rarely left the door, wherein their sires and grandsires served before. Thus gossip rose, as gossip rises best, when mystery imparts a keener zest. Seclusion oft the poison tongue attracts, and scandal prospers on a dearth of facts. T'was said that Sir had more than once been spied, alone at midnight, by the river side. With aspect so uncouth, and gaze so strange, that rustics crossed themselves to see the change. Yet none, when pressed, could clearly say or know just what it was, or why they trembled so. Dublois, as rumor whispered, feared to pray, nor used his chapel on the Sabbath day. However this may have been, t'was known at least, his household had no chaplain, monk, or priest. But if the master lived in dubious fame, twice feared and hated was his noble dame. As dark as he, in features wild and proud, and with a weird supernal grace endowed, the haughty mistress scorned the rural train, who sought to learn her source, but sought in vain. Old women called her eyes too bright by half, and nervous children shivered at her laugh. Richard the dwarf, whose word had little weight, vowed she was like a serpent in her gait, whilst ancient Pierre, the aged often heir, laid all her husband's mystery to her. Still more absurd were those odd muttered things that calumny to curious listeners brings, those subtle slanders told with downcast face, a muffled voice, those tales no man may trace. Tales that the faith of old wives can command, though always heard at sixth or seventh hand. Thus village legend darkly would imply that Dame Dubois possessed an evil eye, or going further, furtively suggest a lurking spark of sorcery in her breast. Old Mare Allard, herself half a witch, once said, the lady's glance worked strangely on the dead. So lived the pair, like many another too, that shunned the crowd and shrink from public view. They scorned the doubts by every peasant shown, and asked but one thing, to be let alone. T'was Candlemas, the dreariest time of year, with fall long gone and spring too far to cheer, when little Jean, the bailiff's son and heir, fell sick and threw the doctors in despair. A child so stout and strong, that few would think an hour might carry him to death's dark brink. Yet pale he lay, though hidden was the cause, and Galen's searched in vain through nature's laws. But stricken sadness could not quite suppress the roving thought or wrinkled Grandam's guess. Though spoke by stealth, t'was known to half a score that Dame Dublas rode by the day before. She had, they said, with glances weird and wild, paused by the gate to view the prattling child, nor did they like the smile which seemed to trace new lines of evil on her proud dark face. These things they whispered when the mother's cry told of the end 
the gentle soul gone by. In genuine grief the kindly watcher wept, whilst the loved babe with saints and angels slept. The village priest his simple rites went through, and good Michel nailed up the box of you. Around the corpse the holy candles burned, the mourners sighed, the parents dumbly yearned. Then one by one each sought his humble bed, and left the lonely mother with her dead. Late in the night it was, when o'er the vale the storm king swept with pandemonic gale. Deep piled the cruel snow, yet strange to tell, the lightning sputtered while the white flakes fell. A hideous presence seemed abroad to steal, and terror sounded in the thunder's peal. Within the house of grief the tapers glowed, whilst the poor mother bowed beneath her load. Her salty eyes too tired now to weep, too pained to see, too sad to close in sleep. The clock struck three above the tempest heard, when something near the lifeless infant stirred. Some slippery thing that flopped in awkward way, and climbed the table where the coffin lay. With scaly convolutions strove to find the cold still clay that death had left behind. The nodding mother hears, starts broad awake, empowered to reason, yet too stunned to shake. The poisonous thing she sees, and nimbly foils, the ghoulish purpose of the quivering coils. With ready axe, the serpent's head she cleaves, and thrills with savage triumph while she grieves. The injured reptile, hissing, glides from sight, and hides its cloven carcass in the night. The weeks slipped by, and gossip's tongue began, to call the Sir Dublas an altered man. With curious mien, he oft would pace along, the village street, and eye the gaping throng. Yet whilst he showed himself as ne'er before, his wild-eyed lady was observed no more. In course of time, t'was scarce thought odd or ill, that he his ears with village lore should fill. Nor was the town with special rumor rife, when he sought out the bailiff and his wife. Their tale of sorrow, with its ghastly end, was told indeed by every wondering friend. The sir heard all and lowering ride away, nor was he seen again for many a day. When vernal sunshine shed its cheering glow, and genial zephyrs blew away the snow, to frightened swains a horror was revealed in the damp herbage of a melting field. There, half preserved by winter's frigid bed, lay the dark Dame Dubois, untimely dead. By some assassin's stroke most foully slain, her shapely brow and temples cleft in twain. Reluctant hands the dismal burden bore, to the stone arches of the husband's door, where silent serfs the ghastly thing received, trembling with fright, but less amazed than grieved. The sir his dame beheld with blazing eyes, and shook with anger more than with surprise. At least tis thus the stupid peasants told, their wide-mouthed wives when they the tale unrolled. The village wondered why Dublas had kept, his spouse's loss unmentioned and unwept. Nor were there lacking slanderous tongues to claim that the dark master was himself to blame. But village talk could scarcely hope to solve a crime so deep, and thus the months revolve. The rural train repeat the gruesome tale, and gape and marvel more than they bewail. Swift flew the sun and winter once again, with icy talons gripped the frigid plain. December brought its store of Christmas cheer, and grateful peasants hailed the opening year. But by the hearth as Candlemas drew nigh, the whispering ancients spoke of things gone by. Few had forgot the dark demonic lore of things that came the Candlemas before, and many a crone intently eyed the house where dwelt the saddened bailiff and his spouse. At last the day arrived, the sky o'erspread, with darkening messengers and clouds of lead. Each neighboring grove aeolian warning sighed, and thickening terrors broadcast seemed to bide. The good folk, though they knew not why, would run, swift past the bailiff's door, the scene to shun. Within the house the grieving couple wept, and mourned the child who now forever slept. 
On rushed the dusk in doubly hideous form, borne on the pinions of the gathering storm. Unusual murmurs filled the rainless wind. The rising river lashed the troubled shore. Black through the night the awful storm god prowled, and froze the listener's lifeblood as he howled. Gigantic trees like supple rushes swayed, whilst for his home the trembling cotter prayed. Now falls a sudden lull amidst the gale. With lessening force the circling currents wail. Far down the stream that laves the neighboring mead Burst a new ululation wildly keyed. The peasants train a frantic mane assume And huddle closer in the spectral gloom. To each strained ear the truth too well is known, For that dread sound can come from wolves alone. The rustics close attend when e'er they think A lupine army swarms the river's brink. From out the waters leap a howling train That rend the air and scatter o'er the plain. With flaming orbs the frothing creatures fly And chant with hellish voice their hungry cry. First of the pack a mighty monster leaps With fearless tread and martial order keeps. The attendant wolves his yelping tones obey And forming columns for the coming fray. No frightened swain they harm but silent bound With a fixed purpose o'er the frozen ground. Straight course the monsters through the village street, On holy vigor in their flying feet. Through half-shut blinds the sheltered peasants peer, And wax in wonder as they lose their fear. The excited pack at last their goal perceive, And the vexed air with deafening clamor cleave. The churls, astonished, watch the unnatural herd, Flock round a cottage at the leader's word. Quick spreads the fearsome fact by rumor blown, that the doomed cottage is the bailiff's own. Round and round the howling demons glide, whilst the fierce leader scales the vine-clad side. The frantic wind its horrid wail renews, and mutters madly through the lifeless yews. In the frail house the bailiff calmly waits, the ravening horde entrusts the impartial fates. But the wan wife revives with curious mien, another monster and an older scene. Amidst the increasing wind that rocks the walls, The dame to him the serpent's deed recalls. Then as a nameless thought fills both their minds, The bare-fanged leader crashes through the blinds. Across the room with murderous fury rife, Leaps the mad wolf and seizes on the wife. With strange intent he drags his shrieking prey Close to the spot where once the coffin lay. Wilder and wilder roars the mountain gale, that sweeps the hills and hurtles through the vale. The ill-made cottage shakes the pack without, dance with new fury in demonic rout. Quick as his thought, the valiant bailiff stands, above the wolf, a weapon in his hands. The ready axe that served a year before now serves as well to slay one monster more. The creature drops inert with shattered head, full on the floor and silent as the dead. The rescued wife recalls the dire alarms and faints from terror in her husband's arms. But as he holds her, all the cottage quakes and with full force the titan tempest breaks. Down crash the walls and o'er their shrinking forms burst the mad revels of the storm of storms. The encircling wolves advance with ghastly pace, hunger and murder in each gleaming face. But as they close from out the hideous night, Flashes a bolt of unexpected light. The vivid scene to every eye appears, And peasants shiver with returning fears. Above the wreck the scathless chimney stays, Its outline glimmering in the fitful rays. Whilst o'er the hearth still hangs the household shrine, The Saviour's image and the cross divine. Round the blessed spot a lambent radiance glows, And shields the cotters from their stealthy foes. Each monstrous creature marks the wondrous glare, Drops, fades, and vanishes in empty air. The village train with startled eyes adore, And count their beads in reverence o'er and o'er. Now fades the light and dies the raging blast, The hours of dread and reign of horror past. Pallid and bruised from out his toppled walls, The panting bailiff with his good wife crawls. Kind hands attend them whilst o'er all the town, a strange sweet peace of spirit settles down. Wonder and fear are stilled in soothing sleep, as through the breaking clouds the moon rays peep. 
He paused the prattling grandam in her speech, confused with age, the tale half out of reach. The listening guest, impatient for a clue, fears tis not one tale, but a blend of two. He fain would know how fared the widowed lord, whose eerie ways the initial theme afford, and marvels that the crone so quick should slight his fate to babble of the wolf-racked night. The old wife, pressed for greater clearness, strives, nods wisely, and her scattered wits revives, yet strangely lingers on her latter tale of wolf and bailiff, miracle and gale. When, quoth the crone, the dawn's bright radiance bathed, the eventful scene so late in terror swathed, the chattering churls that sought the ruined cot found a new marvel in the gruesome spot. From fallen walls a trail of gory red, as of the stricken wolf erratic led, or road and mead the new-dripped crimson wound, till lost amidst the neighboring swampy ground, with wonder unappeased the peasants burned, for what the quicksand takes is ne'er returned. Once more the grandam with a knowing eye stops in her tail to watch a hawk soar by. The wary listener, baffled, seeks anew for some plain statement or enlightening clue. The indulgent crone attends the puzzled plea, yet strangely mutters o'er the mystery. The sir, ah yes, that morning all in vain, his shaking servants scoured the frozen plain. No man had seen him since he rode away, in silence on the dark preceding day. His horse, wild-eyed with some unusual fright, came wandering from the river bank that night. His hunting hound, that mourned with piteous woe, howled by the quicksand swamp his grief to show. The village folk thought much, but uttered less. The servant's search wore out in emptiness. For Sir Dubois, the old wife's tale is o'er, was lost to mortal sight for evermore.